Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Tilson Live. It is Tuesday. It is two o'clock. We are live on YouTube, live on Facebook, coming at you as we do each and every single week, talking about all things building on your land. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Allard, part of the fourth generation of the Tilson family, joined by, well, I got two people today, but most importantly, we have Dawn Dancer, Vice President of Marketing and Customer Experience, joining us. Hello, Dawn. We'll introduce this other guy in a minute. Hi, Eric. Uh, how are you doing today? Good, good. Good. How are good. you? I'm great. I'm great. We're gonna we're gonna speak awkwardly and let him sit there um, as our as our most frequent guest. Um, I want to say some really really kind things about him and see if I can turn him red or at least pink, at least pink. But uh, yeah, we are talking about all things building on your land. We uh, do have an esteemed guest, someone that is a legend. At Tilson Live, a number one guest, most frequent flyer guest. Um, yeah, this is about Justin. Put this stuff away. <laughs> um, truly, am grateful to have my friend, our brother in, in Tilson Arms, Justin Ordino, vice senior vice president of construction for all of Tilson Homes. So, welcome to the Rage and Cajun, Justin Ordino. How are you doing today, sir? Doing good, Eric. I am doing great. Happy it's your birthday. It is. Uh, it is my birthday. Yeah. So, and and uh, here we are doing our jobs. So, yeah. Appreciate the the birthday wishes. This is very nice of folks. Um, yeah, I'm typically a very private person on that kind of stuff. But here we are. So, yeah, it's everybody's got a birthday, right? Your odds are one in three sixty five or three sixty six that it's going to happen. So, it's not unprecedented. It's not, <laughs> it's not unprecedented at all. If you're lucky, it happens every year. So um, it is something. Uh, yeah. So we are talking about, of course, all things build on your lot. But jump in. We are live. Two o'clock. We are on YouTube. We are on Facebook. We want to hear from you. So jump into the comments. Tell us where you're watching from, where you're building, what part of the process you are in. Tell us about where you are in your build on your lot journey. Are you just thinking about doing this? Is this something that, that maybe you've considered for a while and, and, or maybe you have a friend or family member who's done it. Uh, maybe you are in process. Maybe you've done your agreement or you're still working through plans, or maybe you're under construction with one of Justin's esteemed builders rolling through, getting that dream to become a reality. We want to hear from you. Tell us in the comments, what part of the process you're in, where you're watching from and where you're building. Love to hear from you. Um, also, because we do have new people all the time, Justin, if you will give us kind of a brief journey of what brings you here. Why are you, why are you building things for people all across the state of Texas? What's your, what's your why and how you doing here? Well, I, it's so awkward talking to you about this because we've talked about this so many times, but I, I have been enjoying being a part of construction since I was in high school. Um, so it's just kind of launched from there in college. I had the opportunity to work for a third generation framer. Um, so he, he had a lot of great stories about how they used to do things. And, you know, even in my tenure, we've watched things evolve quite a bit, but I really enjoy the market and I enjoy seeing customers move out to properties. I live out in a rural part of Texas and I enjoy being out there. So there's a lot of commonality as I had agricultural background, uh, the love for construction. So they, they married up very nicely to be here. So the Tilson family is fulfilling my dream of being able to do what I want, uh, where I want, uh, sometimes when I want, but generally at their, at their request. I, they, 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 Eddie likes me to be here pretty frequently. So, he uh, does. We actually all like you to be here. So that's <laughs> which, well, thanks for joining us. I know you're a busy, busy guy. You get uh, teams running all over the, the state. Also, by the way, uh, runs our site evaluation team and, often forgotten about, but never underappreciated warranty. So um, it's a big deal for those of you watching. Tilson does have its own warranty department, which is pretty unique among home builders. Uh, we have our own warranty team that Christy Reyes, she oversees that team. And um, she's actually joined us before too, has some videos out there uh, walking you through some of the, the regular maintenance of things. But uh, when you call, if you have an issue on your Tilson home, you call a Tilson phone number and a Tilson phone rings and a Tilson employee answers and a Tilson vehicle shows up with a Tilson employee, employee to fix your Tilson home. It's not some third-party contractor, unless it's, you know, we're not going to send our guy to go fix your AC. We're going to send the AC contractor. But uh, all that to say, we take pride in, in our work and we take our customer service very seriously. We don't want to leave it in the in the hands of somebody we don't know. Um, it's not mm -hmm. accountable to us. So Justin also runs that. I know that takes up sometimes a not a small amount of time. For him. So 
don't want that to be lost on folks that uh, we stand behind that. And you got good people like Justin and Christy at the helm um, steering that way. But last time Justin joined us, I feel like it was a uh, like episodes ago, right? Like it's this is like Knots Landing. You might know Knots Landing. I don't know why I reached for that one of all the ones to pick from, but that one's pretty random. I know it's a good one though. I don't know. I think that's a very grandparents type of show. But um, he we talked about foundations. So obviously we can answer any questions y'all want to uh, about building on your lot, about site evaluation, about. Um, design about some high level pricing about financing construction warranty what happens all that kind of stuff um we talked before again about foundations this time justin is going to walk us through the framing so the next part once that foundation is laid once that slab is down um what the next steps are and a lot of the why we do what we do so you know you can buy sticks and bricks anywhere we say that all the time um, there's reasons that we use the products and the methods that we do. And so Justin's going to walk us through some of those uh, after Don tells us who all is joining us today. But drop your questions into the chat. Again, we want to hear where you're watching from, where you're building, what part of the process you're in, and any questions or comments you may have about anything related to home building or life. Justin's a great life coach. Um, so he's got he's got that up to sleeve too. Man. We can talk about All right. therapy with Justin. We can do that if you want to. I'm up. Short conversation. <laughs> Straighten you out. Yeah. You will. Fair enough. I kind of hope somebody asks. All <laughs> right. Um, we've got Jeez. Denise joining us. She says, happy birthday, Eric. I think it'd at least be entertaining. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. Uh, we got Jason saying, hey, hey guys. Jason, hey, Jason. Welcome Jason. Back, man. Uh, we got Misty saying happy birthday, Eric. Hello from Mansfield, building the San Jacinto XL in Hood County. Had a great time last Saturday at the Muddy Boots Seminar. Good turnout, starting drywall this week. Awesome. Beautiful. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about that event. So thank you for allowing us to share your home. Yeah, and letting us hold off for a little bit. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, we got Alyssa saying happy birthday, Eric. Thank you, Alicia. We've got Nidia saying hello, everybody. Hey. Happy birthday, Eric, from the Melissa office. She sent me a um, picture our, of her, me and her in, our, in my Bob Ross costume from last year. That was special. That's awesome. Uh, we got Daniel, our our friend Daniel's still in Japan. Uh, yeah. So Tuesday at 2 p.m., more like 4 a.m. Wednesday here in Japan. Uh, Justin, so there's a burger still, joint in Japan. We got in, in Okinawa. So we got to go. go eat at. Yep. So Sandbox. We can't reach Eric and I next week. We are we are at the burger joint. Yeah. They don't open till till later. They're not open right now. That's why Daniel's joining us. The, the Sandbox yeah. is not open till about 11 a.m. Best uh, I can tell. Uh, we got Alicia saying purchasing land back home in Newton County. Do oh. you build there? Just when we get all the way out there in Newton, I think we will. Oh. So deep east Texas, uh, kind of east of Jasper. Yep. Got that covered. Tom Homer will be happy to run through hoops to make that happen. <laughs> Gladly. So. so yes. All right. Perfect. All right. We got Jason saying, I can't wait until we can move forward with our dream. I'm glad you guys are going to build it for oh, us. Oh, nice, oh, Jason. Appreciate nice. that, man. I like his profile. Um, like the blue bonnets. We got Phyllis saying, hey, Eric, we're in the process of building the Breckenridge Plan C in B Bosque, Bosque County. Yeah. Bosque County. I heard you say something about insulating the garage and potential of a moisture problem. How do we find out if this would be an issue? We bring a guy on that's a subject matter that's expert. That's it. how, Phyllis. We talked to Justin. So we got, we got a question. You can bring it to speed, Jess. We got a question last week. Uh, a customer built out in the Beaumont area. Um once we talked about what the air hawks were, right, and why why we need those there because we're not insulating the porches and garages, that kind of stuff, um, and why that could, depending on where you are, produce a moisture problem if you insulated a, a spot that doesn't have a way to get fresh air uh, or air condition the airspace. Um, it's not to say that we can't or won't insulate garages because we do and have with spray foam. But Justin, walk us through your your thoughts theory on. Um, on insulating spray foam insulation in a garage so you you can do it but you are going to have to conceal that area um, from or you're not going to conceal that area from the living area like we typically would um, those areas being conditioned when with moving into the spray foam position only the only the area above the living is what we will spray foam we actually wall that off in the attic so it's not just a break so you won't be able to see into that garage or that porch um, from inside the attic um, in that area. So you can insulate it. It just changes what we have to do as far as not putting in that hot wall or that break between those areas. And it just becomes conditioned space. And that might cause your air conditioner to be a different size. 
you would not be ventilating that any longer. I'd probably start looking at insulated garage doors. Like there's no reason to not, if you're going to do the walls and you're going to go through this trouble, still not going to be an airtight area, um, but it's something that if you're going to invest the money, you might as well go ahead and see it across the finish line and do the insulated garage doors. So yeah, your, your consultant yeah. can uh, uh, request pricing on, on uh, getting insulation, uh, insulating the walls in the attic of your garage. Um, if you're in construction, because I don't know where you are, Phyllis, I'm terribly sorry. I see you're in Bosque County, about where the process you are. Justin, what, what process would you want to see happen if they're already under construction? Maybe they're at the stage we're about to talk about, this frame stage. Is there something that you would like uh, to see? The sooner the better. Um, so there, there's a lot. As y'all build the file um, and you're designing and you're picking your selections, site evaluations done, all of that work is going in to create a file that's very concise and we distribute all that information to our vendors as soon as we can. Uh, we do hold some of it uh, just for timely, uh, timing of the process. But the sooner we know about anything, if it's under construction, there could be some things that we don't want to have to tear out later. So we might be able to make sure that we're not going to have to charge you additional money that would be unnecessary. So the sooner we get any kind of notice of any thought, um, the better we talk through that um, and not hold up construction also. I uh, want to keep that project moving. Uh, at the pace that we can, um, so just to avoid delays. Very difficult to do after the sheetrock stage. It, it, yes, then, then we're, it's a whole other conversation. <laughs> That's right. Great question, right. though. Awesome. Um, and Phyllis also says happy birthday. Thanks, Phyllis. We got Crystal saying happy birthday. Hey. Um, and also asking what price do homes start at in Brazoria County? All right, well... <laughs> We actually brought up pricing this time, just in case someone asked, and they did. Um, all right, so Resort County, I'm going to go get our, with the Rio, um, maybe the San Antonio. Which one it would be? It'd be close between those two. Let's grab the San Antonio. How about that? San Antonio comes in at just a hair under right at 1,200 square feet. Um, you're starting out about uh, 199. Let's just call it right at 200,000, Crystal. Um, that's a three bedroom, two bath, um, completely finished home, stubbed out for all the utilities. It is 1,224 square feet. That also, where you're building, it also includes the windstorm certification and compliance. So it, there's a little bit of engineering that goes on, um, more than most people care to know, but then a significant amount of um, metal strapping and shear walls and all kinds of fun stuff that if you actually cruise through, I may not be able to see it at this point, but um our Angleton office has a lot of information on that just because they have two houses going up as we speak that are obviously mm -hmm. being built in Brazoria County to windstorm. Um, so a lot of uh, Dawn got to go see that we were there when she was in town a couple weeks ago. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, a lot of steel in that house, <laughs> a lot of metal pieces and parts that go into all windstorm homes. So that's included there. Okay. And again, today is April 9th, 2024, when we're quoting that price. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot to do that. Um, you know, for and, sure, it's April 9th. We got that established through the comments. And Crystal, <laughs> I'm also going to um, send you a link because you can actually look at our prices on our website. Um, so that'll give you our, our starting price. And I filtered it for you to Brazoria County. <clears throat> wow. That's pretty fancy. All right. Uh, we got Denise. Her plan is to build the canyon in Washington County, and we'll get back with John in the spring office to finalize in October, trying to get our lot paid down a bit. Awesome. All right. Um, and Phyllis, who was asking about insulating her garage, is still in design. Uh, we're also creating an additional storage space in the garage that would not be insulated. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, and Denise is saying windstorm is exactly why are we why we are moving from Brazoria County to Washington yeah, County. I think she's in Pearland, if I remember right. Yeah, makes sense. Yes. All right. Very, very cool. Well, folks, obviously, keep dropping your questions, comments into the chat. We want to hear from you. We want, you know, they're the only bad questions, only dumb questions are the ones that don't go asked. So mm -hmm. ask all the questions. That's why we're here. Uh, we have to be here whether y'all are asking these questions or not. So if you don't ask questions, we have to go to like to day jobs and stuff. And we don't want to do that. It's, come, it's raining outside. We want to be here and talk to you. So if you're thinking it, Somebody else probably is too. Ask the question. We want to help you guys out. We want this to be the most informative, transparent process you've ever been involved in and uh, remove any kind of fears or unknowns or the stuff like that. That's why we do this show. 
And part of why we do this show is to better educate you guys. And so Justin's going to spend some time. I'm going to do the slides. So if there's any mistakes, it's on me. And Justin's going to walk us through, okay, we've got the foundation that we did. We set the forms. We got the plumbing in. We got the cables in. We got a little bit of rebar in there. We've placed the slab. We've poured out all the concrete. Um, and now what happens? Well, first of all, take us a little bit through the difference between stick built and maybe some other modular or or trust alternatives. What 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 what's the customer going to see? Is it going to show up the roof kind of looking like this? Is it going to show up? How's it look when they drive out there before we start framing? Well, this is the most beautiful scene on a construction site to me. I love the frame. I love looking at my rafters, especially on a hip roof like this, and how they all tie in. It's just it's it's my favorite thing to see go up. Um, I am a bit biased. So we, we do all stick framing as the industry calls it. So you're going to see everything being made on the job site. Uh, unlike trusses, a lot, a lot of construction up north, they use a lot of truss construction because of the time constraints they have to actually operate. Uh, the winters are very harsh, whereas here we don't have that demand uh, or command for the weather that they do. Uh, so the trusses are a great option. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of buildings are actually constructed in Texas with trusses. But when we start customizing that ability to order a truss package, because they have to come out and order to accommodate the length of those trusses becomes a little bit more of a challenge. So we still believe that the best avenue is to go ahead and build everything on site as far as our frame goes. Um, so. It is the most exciting part. It really brings the home to life. Um, and then it kind of gets boring for a little bit as we start getting into mechanicals, not to disrupt my electricians, plumbers, and HVAC guys, but they're kind of the kind of the things everybody enjoys, but nobody appreciates necessarily what goes into. But the frame uh, itself, the, the sticks and bricks of the frame, we're asking everything of this. Uh, we're needing it to hold things up, we need the frame to hold things down and we also need it to hold from keeping things from blowing over. Um, so there's, there's a lot of demand on the frame that we build. Um, the other thing is customers and fixed components design the house. Um, so if we have a, a bathtub that's going to go in a room, you can order some specialty things possibly that might be four foot, but your standard bathtub is going to be five foot. So when we're designing that house, it's got to be that exact measurement. Our framer has to execute that. Um, so along with all the structural components, the framer is also making sure that the other contractors that will follow are set up for success. Uh, make sure everything's going to fit. Um, so that's, and they're setting up, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about for the energy efficiency of that home. Um, so they really drive all the success for everybody else behind them at this point, just like our foundation contractor. Um, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to tackle before we get into the actual sticks um, is the, the conversation I hear uh, regularly about home needs to breathe. Um, and that is 100 percent correct. But the, the market and codes have kind of steered us in this direction um, that we need to have the most energy efficient home that we possibly can. So we're going to achieve that by getting all these components to work together. It's a systematic approach to making sure that everything's coordinated and working together. And the framer is going to set the stage for that. Um, as far as the breathing of a home, I get this question and I ask people, how much does it need to breathe? And they're like, I don't know. I was just told it needs to breathe. And I'm in a complete agreement that the home does need to breathe. Um, but we don't need it to hyperventilate. If we're going to personify the structure, we're, we're going to say we don't want it hyperventilating. So what we're going to do is seal this thing up as tight as we possibly can. And then we're going to introduce electric components in the AC that are going to monitor how much breathing that home is doing. We can modify that to make sure it's appropriate, reduce it if necessary. And we're going to get into that in subsequent videos or Facebook lives as we go through that. Um, so, but the framer is going to set the stage actually for energy efficiency. Um, so now why don't we hit the next slide and I'm going to hit on this. Uh, we're going to talk about our walls first and there's some other pictures. It's kind of hard to really pull all these together, but Within our walls, one of the first things we'll do to start sealing, so this is why we do what we do here, we'll put down a layer of seal seal below our exterior toe plate. Our toe plate is going to be the bottom board that rests on the concrete, but sandwiched in between there is this little thin strip of seal seal. And what that does is it compresses as that wall is being laid on top of the concrete, 
to try and make it as airtight as humanly possible. And there's some other things that we'll do later to continue that seal, but that is the first step in that frame uh, to sealing off the home for energy efficiency. The other thing that we're going to do on our exterior walls is we're going to use a foam. It's an R3 uh, value, half inch foam that goes in between the headers. The old days when I used to frame, we used to use a plywood or an OSB, and all it is is a spacer. But we're actually grabbing some R value so that we're, again, increasing the amount of energy efficiency through these little frame techniques that we're applying in. So, Don, why don't we roll to the next picture here? And so all of our studs are spaced 16 inches on center. Um, we also are going to use some some more advanced framing, as you would call it. And this is a picture, it's kind of hard to show here, but we use California corners and ladder tees. And back when I was framing, we used to frame these where they were a solid stud pack, wherever we had a wall that was perpendicular from the exterior, which when you did that, it sealed off and not allowed you to push insulation back there, which creates a hot spot. Um, if you're taking infrared camera in older homes, You'll see they have insulation on the walls, but everywhere there's a wall that's running perpendicular, it's going to cast red every single time. So we got smarter and we said, hey, we can put blocking in here like we've shown here, uh, the horizontal blocking. And this allows us to get that spray foam in behind that. So we're increasing the R value of that wall. So your average stud is going to have an R value of about 4.5. Whereas my spray foam, your average is going to be 12 and a half, 13. So by increasing that, we're sealing it off and it's guaranteed that we're going to get a higher energy rating by doing these little simple things in the frame techniques that we're using. Um, we don't have a great picture of a California corner, but it is the same concept that does allow that insulation to go in behind that wall. Uh, so we increase it. So the next picture that we have here. Some other things that we're going to do, again, I'm going to go back to, we're setting the framer, setting the stage for the success of the following contractors. So for the drywall guys, even our electricians and plumbers, we're going to come in here and we're going to start adding additional blocking. In this case, it is for the cabinets that are going to this kitchen. Um, other things would be hardware. Uh, if we have any kind of handrails or anything like that, the framer is going to go ahead and include those as part of the framing uh, practice. One of the things that you're going to notice that we do, um, every one of these homes you've designed, you put your touch, you put your stamp, you made the selections. We have a plan that they're all going to follow. And a lot of times as their trades are moving through, my builders are going to come through and they're going to take all those incremental measurements and they're going to make sure that everything's centered and that our stud spacing is appropriate so those components will fit inside that stud cavity. So here you can see a C. It's very vague on the screen, but there is a C. So he's dictating to the AC contractor where that vent pipe for that cooktop is going to go. So it's going to be very common that you're going to see these marks along with other marks all across the slab. It's directing traffic. It's how we communicate to the trade when we're not there on the job site. So they know exactly where to go, exactly where we've de dedicated that component to be placed. So Oh, Don, you're it's, it's me. I'm the one that's messing it up. I do. Oh, this Eric, right quit now. messing me up. I know it's your birthday, but you can't make mistakes on your birthday. It's true. That's yes. true. So within the walls, those are the things that we're going to do to make sure that we're, again, trying to maximize the energy efficiency at home. We will never sacrifice structure for energy efficiency. Uh, structure's got to come first. So it has to perform the uplift, the down. And then it also has to be able to protect us from shear. The other thing, once we get our walls up, now we're going to move into our rafters. And what you're going to see in this picture is our rafter spacing and our joist spacing is 19.2. So the decision around 19.2 with the spray foam is, again, an R value of a two by is going to be very minimal compared to that of spray foam. So we've kind of split the difference. You will see some builders that are spanning 24 inches. Some builders are going to go out there and they're spanning 16. Neither is wrong. I like the happy media of a 19.2 because it kind of guarantees that I'm not going to see the ripples in the roof. And it also allows me to insulate more of that area between those, which is, again, maximizing my R value out of my spray foam there. So the... 
the R values that we're going to gain from there. Now, I was hoping that this picture, and I forgot, but we were sealing off from that question about the garage, but I don't have that here. So I thought I might find an area where I could show that. Unfortunately, I don't have it. We'll have to address that somewhere else. But you could describe, so basically where, where the mouse cursor is uh, here, um, it, let's say this was the garage over here, for example. What you're sure. saying is there'd be a piece of Tyvek, perhaps, or something, a partition of some sort that is vertical here in the actual attic itself. Yes, and that area would be sealed off completely separate. No insulation there. We do have to vent it because we need that heat to escape. Uh, we can't allow it to get trapped in there because other things start to happen that aren't good then. But if we were going to foam that, you would just leave it just as is and you spray your foam and you move down the road and it becomes conditioned space. Beautiful. Well, Don, you want to pause for a second? We've got a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, sure. And then we can roll through the, the rest of the presentation. <sighs> It's it still makes you big. I don't know. It didn't make me big. Bad habits made me big. That's got nothing to do with the PowerPoint. <laughs> All right. We've got Bruce who's sharing getting started on our custom one of a kind Angelina and the Cliffs oh. Resort on Possum Kingdom Lake. Ooh. Beautiful. It's a beautiful area. I want to see Thank pictures, you. Bruce. Send us pictures. Yeah. Um, we've got Kim saying, Can you tell us what the siding is for the Canyon Sea? Okay, so Justin, we got what are the different types of hard? It's all James Hardy product. We're using a Hardy plank. Um, we've got, but we've got. What's the difference between Hardy plank and maybe um, board and bat Hardy? And, and board and bat's what's on the Canyon Sea. Board and bat Hardy. But what are some of the differences? And what sheets so, does it come in? How does that work? And so why there is work, there is quite a variety of Hardy. They they make it a lot of different sizes. So any kind of one by that you want, uh, one by two, one by three, one by four. I think her question is more directed at the actual board and bat strips. Yeah. So they the what you will see on the, the, the face of it, the bulk, before you see the board, the vertical board pieces, that is not a soffit material. So they make Don, it you want to pull it up on, I'm sorry, you want to pull it up pick a picture up on the website while he's talking about it. Make it a little more so yeah, I can do that. So they make a four by eight, four by nine. They make various size sheets of Hardy. Some of that is designed specifically to go into soffits. So that's the ceiling underneath your porch. And then they actually make a thicker one that is required whenever you go into a board and bat design. We use that thicker one. It's for the manufacturer specs. And there you go. Beautiful picture. So you will see on a board and bat design that we, we use a couple different products there is a four by eight and a four by nine but they also make a 16 inch wide by 12 foot tall piece so we try to intermingle these uh one it minimizes waste uh to be perfectly honest so if we have a eight foot plate you can run a four by eight and it's continuous from top to bottom and it maximizes the efficiency of the contractor and it doesn't leave a bunch of debris laying around when you start getting into the gables we might transition over to a different material and when you do that, when they're when they're butted together vertically, you're going to find that we end up with a little piece of flashing there. Um, so we have to make sure that no moisture is getting in behind that hardy on the backside and hitting our Tyvek. We want to control that as much as possible. Tyvek will help mitigate some of that, but it's no reason to be dumping water down there. So that's also a manufacturer spec for that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. We, we do use the full James Hardy system, so y'all know. Um, that, so we've got the, the Hardy plank or board and bat that we're using com combined with the Hardy soffit that we're using combined with the Hardy fascia, which, by the way, like Justin was saying, we, we do use the full three-quarter inch thick, the one by four Hardy. A lot of builders, that they'll use a, a five-sixteenths for their fascia, um, which is brave. Um, but in, in doing so, the Hardy gives a 30 year warranty. If you use the complete James Hardy system, um, really all you gotta do is paint it, uh, caulk it and paint mm -hmm. it. Um, that really the only maintenance you got to it. It is cement fiberboard. Um, it's tough, tough, tough material. I hope I answered Kim's question. So we'll, we'll hopefully get a thumbs up on that. More than bet. Oh, you need the validation, buddy. I got you. I do. I, I, do. I need validate. You do this all the time. You don't need it anymore. I do. <laughs> All right. Well, Daniel is asking when oversizing a garage, at what size span does the cost increase mm. exponentially due to the ceiling beam lengths required? That's a great question. That's a great question. I'm glad that, that Justin's here to answer it. 
I guess that well, would let it be known it. that Tim told him thank you. So we can now move on to the next question. Thank you. There's, your, val there's, your, val there's your validation. I needed that today. Yeah. My man. So, okay. so when you're oversizing a garage, it I guess it depends which directions you're oversizing. So if you're going deep and you're also making it wider, um, I don't know the breaking point of that necessarily, but the, if you're going both directions, all of a sudden we're not spanning with an eye joist, which is something we'll cover a little bit in our joist. You kind of segued on this. This will actually work and we don't have to talk about it anymore. But so some of these spans, when we get into the garages, we will span with an eye joist just because it makes it's more cost effective for you. And we do not have to incorporate LVLs, paralims, any kind of beam that would go in there. If you're going wider and it's just going to stay at 22 to 24 foot you're not having to add any additional beams most likely unless we're starting to support a roof load that's above it um, so there's just a lot that goes into that to actually give you a definitive hey this is where the problem comes uh, but typically at 24 foot deep and you can run however far you need to and we're probably gonna have to throw some beams at it but i can't give you an exact on that yeah and you use the word exponentially so we're going to be able to to really accomplish almost anything with engineered wood product of some sort like like justin was saying uh which whether that's an lvl whether that's i beams whether that's um paralams like he's saying like which is just engineered wood product it's product that's designed to it's made it's manufactured in a factory and it is designed to carry a large load over a big span um i think when you get the word exponentially my head goes to we're gonna have to start using some red iron some steel of some sort that's probably when, when you start to get over 40 feet in any direction that's yeah. that's when the costs are going to yeah. go up exponentially there'll be incremental up up to that point up to probably 36 38 feet um but we believe would be an example of that daniel's saying he, he heard 24 and that's what he was looking to confirm yeah 24 is no factor at all and again i, I wouldn't even get scared at 30 or 35 it's because you're still going to just be using engineered wood product it's when you start to get much over that 35 36 like you said wimberly and even the uh what's the the paladuro um some of those where you could start spanning beyond that and and that if we have to start getting red iron or steel involved in it, that's when it will be an exponentially more and try to quantify that is that fair your concrete and your frame are really where you're caught i mean the drywall electrical i mean you're not i mean that's just your normal cost yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I would draw it up. I love big garages. So he's a man after my own heart. So draw it up. Let's see what it costs. <laughs> um, actually, I was thinking we have the Hodgins here who have probably the biggest garage I've ever seen that we've built. Uh, so their garage is 45 feet, four inches by 38 feet and had to put four post beams for extra support. Um, yeah. And there's a house attached to it, believe it or not. Like it's nearby. Yeah. There's like a whole other house too. It's crazy. <laughs> 1600 square foot garage i love it yeah it's perfect uh we got jason asking what sear is the rating on the ac that is used it depends on the manual j um they also had an update to the sear ratings which anytime they make a, a, a government mandated change and they change the sear ratings mm -hmm. uh, it sends everybody into a tizzy uh, but we we're compliant with that, but our CR rating is 16, I believe, generally on most of our units, unless that manual J would come back for some reason and require something. Um, and there's ways to pull the components together to achieve that CR rating. So this is this is a broader question than what I think I can give an answer or you to. Can get as, as a hater of the acronyms, may, may I explain to folks what SEER stands for? Yes. Yes. And okay. then someone can explain what manual J is. Yes. Yeah, se se seasonal energy efficiency rating. Uh, which is just a, an agreed upon industry standard of here's what we're going to decide is it, it is arbitrary, but here's what we're going to decide a, how efficiently an HVAC unit runs. Like Justin's telling you and about to tell you, it doesn't tell you the whole story. So, but, but 16 SEER equipment is kind of our, our base spec or specification. And then it could go up from there, but my example I use, and you'll probably have a better one, is kind of the, the horsepower at the flywheel of an engine versus the horsepower at the rear wheels, right? You lose some of that power as it goes through the drive shaft and to the rear end of the car and then to the actual tire. So you, if they're advertising you have 420 horsepower 
maybe you do at the where the at the very back of the engine, but by the time it gets to the rear tires, maybe it's 360, 365. Sear is no different. Um, and what we have to do, ours is an achieved number, right? We have to achieve a Sear rating. And when we, how do we, what, what do we do with the equipment? What, what's a matched system? What, what's the science that goes behind that a little bit? Well, and then the other, the other part to this, you can have the highest SEER rating, but if the other components that are around it, if you're not sealed up, if you're not, you're using the R values that you're supposed to, so that you can toss that in. So when we're, when we're talking about this, you can't just talk about one component. Um, you, you have to look at the holistic approach again and uh, making sure everything's paired up appropriately. Um, so that's, I, I think that's what the spray foam and the R values we're achieving out of that. The additional ceiling that we put in um, is going to produce that. And the other thing I, I, I get frequently because we're talking about air conditioning, um, it, Eric's comparison to the flywheel. This isn't a Mustang. Uh, if I was going to buy a car, I'd buy the five liter just because that's what I would want. Um, but we really need the four cylinder in the home. We actually want the air conditioner running frequently. Um, it assists with humidity. And it also, it, it's gonna draw down, the, every time that motor is starting up, we start getting into some conditions called short cycles. Uh, that can create some other issues on the other side of the house. So it's important that we pair all of this together um, and not just start grabbing things just because they're more efficient. Doesn't mean they're necessarily going to perform the best in your home. So Dawn, explain to them what a manual J is. Or you want me to explain? That's not fair. Okay. <laughs> um, so a manual J got, um, guys, is it's, it's basically a software system where we input all of the information about your house. So we're looking at the square footage, the direction it's facing, how much of your exterior wall is window? Um, what is the house made out of? Where is it? Um, all of those kinds of things to actually calculate what you need in your HVAC system, mm -hmm. specifically for your home. So that's what um, Justin was referring to when he said, hey, it's, it's going to be whatever SEER the manual J says. Like it's going to spit out a, this is the system. This is how, I think it's also related to this. Denise is asking, is yeah. there a square footage that would require more than one AC unit? It's really going to depend upon what, all the soft, you know, all of this programming that goes into the manual J says this is the correct system for your house. Yeah, um, and, to make and sure that we're you're avoiding those short cycles and things like Sorry, that. Yeah, in, in Washington County, but let's say you know maybe a, maybe a twenty two hundred square foot house in Possum Kingdom where our friend Mr. Mosley's building, it doesn't need it, but maybe someone building us that exact same house in Matagorda, Texas, they might. So it, it is going to depend, like Don's saying, on where you're building, and and uh, but there's not. There, there was an old rule of thumb of way days gone by of about a ton for every 500 square feet. Okay. Well, that was, that's been gone since the early two thousands. Um, so don't, don't let anybody steer you wrong or the internet, um, which the internet usually doesn't. Internet's usually pretty accurate information. If you dig long enough, it's very, very reliable. So if you, uh, but there's not all of this is to say there's a lot of science is very specific to your exact home on your exact piece of property. Um, it's not just a willy nilly. Like, we think about this much like it's going to be down to the a science uh, to what we talk about a match system, what compressor that we're using and the C rating on it paired up with what air handler paired up with what dehumidifier paired up with what coil. I mean, down to the model numbers that they will uh, dictate that needs to be done to achieve that highest energy to the stuff that Justin's talking about. Of It's got to cycle long enough to extract the moisture out of the air. That's the whole point of an mm -hmm. air conditioner. The cold air is kind of a byproduct or a way to make that happen. But hopefully that answers that. All right. Perfect. Um, we've got Matt asking, uh, does Tilson have the HVAC system commissioned after the home is finished to ensure the system is working as designed? What do we do, Justin? So we, we have our HVAC contractor. He's one of the last ones that generally, depending on what products you're bringing into the home, um, but he's one of the last ones. He will go do a startup. Um, we do have inspections that will come in after the fact to test his equipment or look at his equipment uh, to make sure everything's hooked up correctly. And then after, as Eric talked about Christy Reyes and our warranty department, we're trying to balance this air conditioning. The problem is, no offense to all of our, our lovely people, but y'all are the biggest variable. Um, so <laughs> when you move in, you put in blinds, you put in shades, or maybe you don't in some rooms. And, it, and I understand. 
but to adequately balance that home, you have to have all the finished features there because um, there is dampers that are within those ducts. Um, there is ways that we talked about with the fresh air that needs to come in. So we have some balancing techniques that we can come in and, and do. Uh, but we are there. There is a two year warranty on the actual system through Tilson. So if you have a problem, you call us for the first two years. We'll deploy the HVAC contractor and we keep in touch with you to make sure everything's operating correctly. But yeah, all that to say, Matt, it, it, we will come out there seven months in. If you're like, man, it is just super hot in this corner bedroom over here. Like no questions asked, no factor. We make an appointment with you. HV guy cru cruises out there and yeah, it may have to rebalance once, like Justin said, everything is set up and you've got shades up and you've got, and the seasons change. Like, and you may have to rebound, you know, mm -hmm. adjust a damper a little bit, but all that's done uh, at no cost to you on every single Tilson home. But yeah, what, what we refer to as a startup is what I think you're referring to as commissioned, where they go in and they check the balance and every, how many cubic feet per minute, which by the way is also dictated by that manual, J, but literally how many CFM every single room needs to get is, is part of that data, that, data set that's put out. Awesome. Let's talk about framing, shall we? Got keep asking your questions. These are fantastic questions. Um, you can tell it's starting to warm up a little bit in places like uh, about this HVAC thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep asking the questions. We got a couple more slides to do. Truly, I think a couple. We want to hear from you. Any more questions about construction, about design, about site evaluation, about site preparation, culverts, septic tanks, driveways, clearing water wells, all that stuff. You want to talk rodeo? Justin can talk rodeo. He grew up team roping. He loves a little rodeo action. Do that. We're all a little different place than we used to be with our lower backs, but he's, he's as good once as he ever was. All right, yes. so <laughs> let's talk. What's going on out here? So we, we talked about our, our frame, our true frame. Now we're going to talk about cornice. And one of the aspects of cornice is going to be the full wrap of the OSB around the exterior. Um, so this is really, at, when we talk about frame, uh, the OSB uh, is providing assistance with the uplift, uh, especially for our folks that are building down along the coast when we start getting into the wind speed maps. Uh, used to be a, a little bit different terminology, but we're conquering the wind speeds with uplift. And we're also working on the shear. So if a high wind comes along, um, it's not blowing our building over. Um, oh. Ooh. Somebody's okay. well, I, I did it. I was trying to show the full OSB. I'm gonna get control. I told him to. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I am the odd man out. They're used to working together, so I'm the odd man out. They just kind of tell me the two of us aren't gonna get right. So what's so, that? <laughs> here we, we try. Just, just stay right there. Don't move. Don't move. I will tell you when to move. Thank you, Eric. Hands off I, the truth. <laughs> So we, we're gonna see this OSB uh, wrapped all around all of our homes in the gables, um, so all the way around the exterior. Um, the other thing that we're gonna do, and it's an unnoticed piece a lot of time, is you see the black poly that's at the bottom that there's a red arrow. That's actually has serving two purposes. One is it acts as a flashing. As you can see on the left-hand side, there's a Tyvek wrap that's going over that. We call that shingle fashion. So if water's coming down that wall, and it will, it's going to feed out, it will touch out onto that poly and then outside of the slab. Um, but that also serves, the poly also serves in our masonry areas that you see here, there's actually a brick ledge. So in the future, we're going to see some stone or brick right there on that ledge. It also allows the expansion and contraction of the brick or masonry uh, to separate from the concrete because those two materials, they're going to expand and contract at different rates. And so by not having this, you could have on that outside corner what we call a shovel crack or a corner crack. So it's serving a couple of purposes that we have there. And then in our next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we can see a little bit more. <laughs> we can see a little bit more here. So we do use Tyvek on all of our homes. Um, it keeps the air and the water uh, out from in the inside, but it also allows uh, water vapor to come from the out to those walls. So it's basically ensuring that that OSB is going to stay dry so that we don't have any problems there. Um, the other part in this picture, we're starting to see this evolve now, the, the outside trim carpenter, if you will, the cornice guy, he's putting in that siding. Um, so everything is hardy. Um, so we, you will see that all through the outside, except the little cedar accents, or if you have a vinyl or a cedar shutter or something of that nature, everything else is going to be hardy. Uh, we've enjoyed that product for 
25 years, I think. It spans, it dates me. I've been here 18, and I know we've been using it since the first day I showed up. Um, and then the last component to framing that we're going to see is our roof deck. And we've got this covered up. It's the same OSB material, um, so we're not using the tech shield any longer. Now that we're in a spray foam, we're going into a straight OSB at 7 16 And then we come back with this black Rhino liner that's manufactured by Owens Corning. It's part of their system, just like Eric talked about, the Hardy system, and we use all of it. There's a warranty there. By using OC's underlayment or the Rhino liner, um, we're able to have the warranty that's associated with the shingles. And I make sure that everything's paired up correctly on our frame here. Beautiful. Beautiful. So the last thing is the windows and doors. Our guys are going to install this. When we start talking about components and how this is put together, so we caulk our windows to make sure that they're sealed up. Again, minimizing as much air infiltration as humanly possible. Um, we also are going to tape the jams. Uh, we caulk jams, tape the windows, also make sure that water is not going to infiltrate the home. So there's a lot of things that have to come together by this contractor to make sure that everybody else is successful. And at the end, you have a home that is sealed as tight as humanly possible. Love it. Wonderful. Love it. So there's method to the madness, you're saying. Method there's, to the madness. There's a lot that goes into the frame. Okay. Well, let's let's talk questions. So, uh, guys, I know that, that obviously we've been talking framing and that's – obviously a critical component to what we do. And there's some whys in there. Uh, if you got questions about that, we'd love to hear it, but all questions relating to build on your land right now, this is the time we want to hear from you. So what's going on? All right. We've got Juan saying, hello, Tilson team. Do you build in inner city Houston? Mm -hmm. And if not, are there future plans? Take us through, Take us back in time, Justin. I should have asked you first. I always let you get me with questions. Hey, I, you're the guest. If you want me to answer, you know that I, I'll, I'll be glad to talk. But My answer will be a lot shorter. We still well, it, <laughs> No. <laughs> we, we do not. Um, it, it really got interesting after Harvey. They, they made some pretty rapid decisions uh, when we moved the 500-year floodplain into the requirements of the 100-year floodplain. You're seeing a lot of builders that are utilizing crawl spaces. You started seeing them lift existing homes um, to get out of that floodplain. And the permitting um, became very interesting at that point. We just realized that for us to go in there, it takes an investment of somebody that's going to be in there all the time. And we just weren't in there enough to master that system like we were pre-Harvey. And so we just made the decision. It was probably time to move on and let the, the folks that occupy that space stay there. Yeah. For, for those of you not familiar with Houston, he's, he's referring to hurricane Harvey, which was in 2017. All of us around here are like, Oh yeah, Harvey, we know exactly. But there may be some folks watching that they don't remember hurricane Harvey because they mm -hmm. didn't have to move people out of their houses on the second floor to live. So that, that the other predictable, that's the, the mechanical side of it. And he's absolutely right. The, the emotional, if I can appeal side is we could not deliver a good customer experience because the city made it so unpredictable. Um, nothing they told you was the same tomorrow. So anything we in turn told the customer we we're going to have to do, the city could come to us tomorrow or to the customer the next day or the next week and completely 180. Um, and that's not a way to treat people. And so for that was the really the straw that broke the camel's back of it's what, I mean, there ain't anywhere, there's no complicated type of construction that we haven't done and can't do. That's not the problem. Justin's team can build whatever you want them to. The struggle comes in if we cannot convey a clear and concise process to our customers that we're going to follow and adhere to if, if the city's going to turn around and change their mind on every whim. And that's what was happening. So mm -hmm. for those reasons, as they say on Shark Tank, we're out. Now, it's not to say that we would never do it. Again, obviously, we we're born and raised in Houston. We've been here since 1932. It's actually where we started building homes. So it doesn't have to be as um, bureaucratic as it is. It does not have to be as unpredictable as it is. Um, you, you're, you're seeing rampant government spending under the guise of helping its citizenry gone completely off the rails. That's what, you, that's what you've seen. Um, 
obviously we're very pro business, <laughs> so we see things differently than some of these other municipalities. And there are plenty of municipalities that are very builder friendly, very development friendly. Houston is not the actual city of Houston is not one of them. Fortunately, the Greater Houston area is comprised of a lot of communities that are absolutely development and builder friendly, and we don't mind driving. So, if if we know nothing about the Greater Houston area and Houstonians, and that's all, all right. I have to say about that, as Forrest Gump says. <laughs> All right, Jason's asking, my biggest concern is getting my property ready to build. Any idea on what I can expect to pay for an access road? I'm guessing I'll be about 120 feet off the roadway. Luckily, so, I don't need a well. If I remember right, Justin, he's in like the Lufkin, Angelina County area. So East Texas, you know, we're not we're not having to do any um, rock excavation. Like what, what, what can he look, 120 foot construction drive? I think we're what, 20 on bucks? April 9th, 2024. What, what do you think that might cost? <laughs> I think we're at what 20, 25 bucks a linear foot. I would so, I would budget at least twenty five dollars a foot. And yeah. and Jason, that wouldn't I would not that doesn't include clearing. So I'm I'm an East Texas kid myself. Um they're gonna need to spend a, a day or so on on some on some tractor work. I used to call it dozer work, but now it's all skid steer work. Um but they're gonna knock the trees down, right, Justin, take the roots out and then come yeah. in. So that and that would be what, like four inch thick crushed rock of some sort on some type of a Usually a clay base, twelve feet wide, with swales on both sides. Like it's it's a properly done crowned. Uh, not to say it won't need to be dressed up at the end, but that's what when we're talking construction drive, that's what we're talking. Is that about right? Yeah, I I, I would assume looking at it also helps if you I, these guys, even if you want to do it on your own, or if you want to contract and we can get you some bids uh, very specific to that. But most people be willing to drive by there. So a lot of time, the soil that they have, there's stuff that they can work with that could reduce, or there's things that can add cost. Um, but I would call a few folks. There's plenty in that area that that love doing that kind of stuff. And I think Juan actually got maybe got him some names. I, I may be wrong about that, but I think if Jason, if I'm wrong about that, yeah, I think correct you're right. me. And, and Juan will give you some names uh, if we haven't already, and they can get you. I mean, we can get that dialed in very easily. All right, perfect. Um, Denise is asking, how does the brick or rock uh, skirting connect to the hardy? It doesn't. Um, oh. So it's <laughs> so it will transition, uh, but there's not actually a mechanical fastener that secures brick or stone to the hardy. Um, so it'll butt up right next to it, but the masonry is secured with brick ties. So we will actually take a nail. It's a little it's kind of a ribbed flat piece of metal. I'm trying to find a way to articulate that. And you are able to bend it. We'll nail that into the stud and then it's L-shaped at that point and it'll squeeze between the uh, mortar joints of either the brick or the stone. And once it's cured, it has some ribs in it. So you can't move that stone in or out. Um, but then the hardy will have a, what, a it's a wainscot piece that comes in so that it diverts that moisture or that water from a rain over the hardy and then beyond the masonry. Um, so I asked her to pull this up so you can kind of see where, where we're talking about, yeah. where we think she's talking about. So what's happening there where that brick is, is stops and the hardy plank starts is what. So we, we have the siding in this case, slap siding that's coming down. And then there's a one by um, that we'll use that is cut at an angle. It's nailed into a nailer that we have. Um, and then the stone or the brick will butt up right below that. And the Mason's job is to secure that underneath there, but it does not physically attach. So I could come through there with a the sledgehammer and I could tear out all this brick and it won't impact the hardy. It won't pull the hardy down. Interesting stuff. Yeah, it's hard to describe if you like we're playing the Pictionary game, whatever it is, or, uh, like heads up. How do you describe galvanized wall ties? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Like, uh, pass. Next question. Yes. <laughs> They're really strong and they do work, and you'll never see them again. Next. <laughs> Pretty much. All right. Um, Dylan is asking for site preparation. Is it better for me to clear a build site and have it prepared or wait for one of you guys to come and give your, give me your thoughts. Also, should I go ahead and drill a well on the property? Uh, I think if you want to clear 
generally no problems with that. Uh, if you if you have the ability, I would tell you that the root ball and the stump as part of that clearing, you need to go ahead and anticipate getting that out if that's where you have designs of the home going. Um, if you have any questions about the property, whether that site is the best location, most cost effective or whatever that is, it might be best to have us come out there and take a look at it before you start bulldozing trees. Uh, I love bulldozers. Uh, I think it's fun to bulldoze things, but I want you bulldozing trees that you might like to have after you close either. So I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine, but please make sure, because if we uncover those fat, those stumps as we're digging up the foundation, we get to have another phone call and talk about the cost of extraction at that point. It's so much easier to do it up front. So we don't want to have that event. Um, so I would say either or. As far as drilling a well, I would tell you some places in the state, uh, they're still waiting eight months. They get on a waiting list and waiting eight months to get a well drilled drilled. Uh, so I would suggest calling them, finding out what their lead times are and what their costs are. Uh, but I would go ahead as soon as I could. As soon as we've got the planning phases, the site evaluator has been out there. We've got good access. Go ahead and get your well drilled. If it's going to be in the back of the house, we want to make sure that we got access back there. So that's not a real challenge and you find yourself taking out more trees later. Um, but if it's in the front, we might tell you to hold off a couple of weeks because we might have an activity that we don't want to damage the well while we're running concrete trucks. Uh, but we can help guide that. But generally speaking, the sooner we get a well in, the better off we are. We get a T pole, we get some temporary power ran over to it. We can discuss how we can do that because um, we are going to need water on the site. Uh, we've got to have water to build. Okay. All right. Darren is asking, what are our thoughts on good lumber versus commodity lumber? Are we a low end builder or do we care? <laughs> That's a great question. So Darren has an opinion and he wants to know if yours is, is yours matches his, I think. <laughs> I, I'm going to say, I'll, I'll address the care part. I'll let Justin address the, I think you can address both. But uh, the, the fact that we're doing this show, we don't charge for it. It's not gated. And what I mean by that, Darren, mm -hmm. is we don't ask for your e anyone's email address to, to log on to this. Our competitors watch. We know they do. It's awesome. You're all terrible. You've tried to do it. You, you can't, you, you can't be done. Uh, all joking aside, we do this because, for y'all like we want you to have a wonderful experience there's there's a ton of ways we could spend marketing dollars in an hour of mine and justin and don's time mm -hmm. and not i'm not tooting our horn i'm just saying with this this is one of the ways that we show that we care uh is doing this and now justin take it away so we use all number two lumber throughout the home in our structure um, so everything that you're going to see will be stamped number two uh, there's no doubt that lumber quality since i when i it was framing. Um, again, I was working for a third generation framer and he would tell me back in the 60s, the 70s. I mean, this guy was nearing knocking on the door of retirement. But you talk about the tightness of the fibers of that lumber compared to what it is today. These are new growth trees. But number two is where we land at. Um, I feel comfortable there uh, as far as grade three or utility grade lumber. We stay away from it. I would tell you that an engineer would tell you it's perfectly acceptable. They have things in the span chart that will allow for number three. Um, finger jointed studs have come along because material has gotten bowed or crowned and things of that nature. We stick at number two. Um, I don't perceive this as a low end builder. Um, if you have something that you would like to enhance, certainly we can look at it. And then your, your budget kind of dictates what low end or high end might be. But I don't view us as a low end builder by any stretch of the imagination. Most well, no, I mean, there, there, there are builders that flat out they cost less than we do. I mean, for yeah. for the same size house, you can get one built cheaper. You can, um, so that that's. Well, yeah. I, you go talk to the high end builder that too, um, and then all of a sudden, where are they at in twelve months? So we haven't moved anywhere since nineteen thirty two. We've been here. We've got a lot of locations you can go to. We're not going to fold up or change the sticker on the truck. So I think when you're evaluating what's low end and what's high end, I want to make sure that whatever I buy is going to be able to be serviced. Um, but the materials that we use, are, I don't know of another builder that's using a higher grade of lumber than what we are to, to answer Darren's question. Okay. Well, and the other one would be... He's also asking about MSR. Um, I, I, again, I'm not, a, I'm not an acronym guy. Um, yeah. so that could stand for a bunch of things. It could stand for mountain safety research. It could stand for, um, it's actually a company called that. It's, 
Um, I mean, Remington made an MSR rifle. There's, there's I don't know what. Um, <laughs> Darren, can you clarify what you mean by MSR? Yeah, help us out. We, we're glad to answer. But what, what, uh, going back to the, not only the grain of lumber that we choose, but think about it in, in volume, right? So, you know, we're buying from our lumber supplier hundreds of homes worth of lumber every year. Um, and so we, we, we have a relationship and it's McCoy's and they're fantastic. Of we, we have sent probably not entire truckloads back, but we have sent bundles of, of materials back. No questions asked. They're like, you know, it does not meet our standards and they pull it, take it back and bring out another load. Um, and they, because they know what our expectations are and, uh, and what our customers' expectations are, quite frankly. Well, and I think when we're talking about that, so there's pieces that we may not, I mean, the, the unique thing about lumber is it's not a component until it's cut and put into place. So a technically a stud, those are, you can certainly order studs, but like a joist, it's not a joist until you nail it up on top of the walls. Um, that could be cut up into blocking. If I'm blocking for cabinets, I'm not going to worry about waning at that point. I, I know what these, it, it's not a structural purpose. It's an additional surface area to secure a cabinet to that is resting on the ground. Um, so it's not going to go anywhere. Um, blocking on T walls when they're on interiors, I'm not worried about waning again there. I know what the purpose of that material is. Um, so even though material may not be the prettiest, there is applications. Deadwood is another spot that you just don't worry. It's resting on top of a wall and it's going to be used to anchor concrete or drywall to. It doesn't have to be pretty. Crowns don't matter on that piece. Uh, that's just not that's not the purpose of what it was intended for. So he's asking about grade stamps. Um, so okay. it, it's, you know, obviously we don't have anything to do with the grading of the lumber that's done actually at the mill. Uh, it's not even done by the supplier necessarily. So that's done by, you know, you, some of the big mills, George Pacific, Louisiana Pacific, Boise Cascade. I mean, there's, there's, I used to say there's a bunch, there's not as many as there used to be, <laughs> but um, the, the grading is done there. And, and MEL versus MSR is getting into tensions and, you know, strength and tensioning and bending and stiffness uh, suffice it to say that, that the code that we build to Justin, you want to go into a little bit of that and how the span tables are arrived at and, and how we follow them and our drafting team follows them. And sure. So, I mean, I, and I'll be honest with you, I, I'll have to do some more research. I have an expert that knows the MEL and the MSR. Uh, I guarantee I could dial him up and get him engaged. And we would all be asleep in six minutes. Yes. Um, <laughs> So there is a span chart that we do follow. Um, so the, our drafting team, fortunately, when you design that plan, you're making alterations. So my drafting team is burdened, unlike in a production, stamp it out uh, every home so they don't change materials. Anytime you make that adjustment, specifically like the garage we were inquiring about earlier, so all of a sudden we have to figure that out up front end so we can order those materials in advance. Um, so all of those band shorts, uh, and we do send our plans off, uh, when we start incorporating beams, they go off to our engineer, he stamps them and says, yes, those are the appropriate size, or he makes modifications to that design and ensure that we're within spec. Yeah. And, and so he's, he's asking about a specific, uh, line of the Weyerhaeuser, who's one of our largest, um, suppliers, uh, but we mainly for engineer wood product. Um, so what the wirehouser framer series is not one that we presently use, but it's not to say that we couldn't price that out if you wanted to have that done. Um, and you're right. Each city does have build, has, has building codes. They don't vary that much on frame. Um, in fact, yeah. Justin would be, he would speak to that. They don't nothing compared to like wind speed rating versus conventional. That's not wind speed and text for text part of insurance. But beyond that, there's not a lot of, difference in building codes from city to city in Texas. Um, and so, you know, suffice it to say, that's why we inspect the homes. Um, they do have to be built to code. That is the city's easy, really. Um, Cause not only are we going to have our own third party inspectors, but you got the city has inspectors. Um, most of them are pretty good. <laughs> and then, uh, but in the counties where you're building in unincorporated areas of Texas, there is nobody to enforce the law, which is a, there is a building code for Texas. It's in our state constitution, but 
Um, we hire third party inspectors for those specifically. So, cause we're humans. So we want to know. Um, and it gives you peace of mind as a buyer to know that the homes we built correctly. And if, if something doesn't span correctly, it's going to get red tagged. Um, that's why we hire them to do that. Does that make, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's why you incorporate it in some of those spans. You'll incorporate and move away from traditional lumber into an eye joist, uh, or some other method of suspending that, that joist in here. So. Yeah. What he's bringing up about the uh, less lumber is that's what Justin was talking a while ago about 24 inch, for example, the code allows for 24 inch span walls, um, ceiling framing, Attic framing, it allows for 24 inch. And there's benefits to that in that you can get more insulation. Like Justin was saying, a, a two by four or two by six or two by eight or whatever is a not as good of an insulator as five and a half inches of spray foam or five and a half inches of bad insulation. Um, but the there's a there's a cost to that, and that cost is structure. Um, and so we've opted for the 19.2 inch on center joist and rafter, 16 inch on center walls interior and exterior that's our happy medium um i know some very good builders that use 24 inch on center nothing wrong with that either um some of them use it on tuba sixes um so they can they can have a little bit more structure to them it's it's there are there is not a one prescribed way you must frame a home There's well that's a, why the span chart exists and i, I think darren's okay. trying to trying to ask questions here about how we utilize that span chart, I believe is where he's headed. But each of those spans that we have is dedicated to making sure that it is the correct load capacity, whether it's a live load or a dead load. Um, so I, I'm not having issues with my, my frame spans at this point. So I don't, and they also update that span chart as well. Um, so it does change. All right, perfect. Great questions, Darren. Thanks right. for reaching out. Um, yeah. Um, Phyllis is asking, are the sidewalks on front of the home and to the side entry of the garage area included, or is that an upgrade that we need to ask for? Any idea of approximate cost? So if you're looking at the pricing that, that Don's put on our website by county, uh, plan by county, the pricing is not included for uh, side for flat work, which would be sidewalks, driveways, that kind of thing, with the exception of a few. Oh, well, no, none of the county stuff, but in some of the cities and subdivision we build in, we do include a certain amount of flat work and driveway that's required by those cities and those subdivisions. Um, and then approximate cost, Justin, you got a you got a cost these days on flat work. Uh, Eric, it is all over the map. I, I would be reluctant. I, I really feel like we could get an accurate price um, for them at the desk. Um, I, I would hate to give a range here because we are still seeing concrete uh, go up in cost. I uh, just got noticed uh, yesterday. I forget which company it was, but we're still seeing increases there. And I'll be honest with you, labor rates are, are quite a bit different as you move across the state. Um, and then sometimes even just a county over can make a difference. Well, that sounds insane, um, but we do see fluctuation in cost as far as that goes. Yeah, Phyllis, I, I would start your budget about 7 to $7.50 per square foot and go up from there probably. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got Nick saying shout out to the Melissa Tilson team. We are building Angelina A in Lone Oak, Hunt County. Uh, we had our stakeout, construction drive, water meter, and electrical poles being installed these next two weeks. Thanks for today. Awesome. No, Glad to you. hear that. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for sharing that. All right. And Jamie is saying building an Angelina B. The slab was poured oh, yesterday. God. Very excited. Tilson has been amazing. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. What a timely presentation we did for Jamie. Yeah. Man, she's all ready to go for you know the next week or two. All right. So folks, so we know it's a little bit past. Uh Darren did give us he gave us a nod. We did a, we did okay. Uh skating our span tables. Um, but all that to say, yeah, we I mean, we love these questions, guys. We love going deep with you guys on um on how and why we do the things that we do. So thank you for joining us. Um mm -hmm. just especially thank you for taking time out of your day to do this, man. I know you got a lot going on and as as my 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 country mom would say, busier than a one arm paper hanger with the itch. That's pretty busy. <laughs> By the way, if you picture that for just a moment, because um, <laughs> we do hang paper now, a little wallpaper action. Justin's excited about that <laughs> uh, from time to time. All that to say, yeah, we we have. Uh, but the good news is, it doesn't have to end here, right? I mean, we've got tons of places that y'all can engage with us. We got twelve design centers, all that have model homes. We're open seven days a week. 
Um, so we got that going on. We got a website, award-winning website open 24-7. We got a Facebook page that you can engage with us and other people in the community that are doing what you're doing or have done what you're thinking about doing. Um, <laughs> excuse me, we've got a YouTube channel that's got hundreds of hours of, of data, of, of um, content is what I was looking for. It doesn't have data. I guess I got some data. Got There's content, some data, yeah. Mainly. Got content about all these very things uh that they go into this whole process so you don't sit there and wonder what happens next or wonder why we're doing what we're doing uh we got new home specialists on standby you can call text email with them uh it helps set you up an appointment one of our design centers we also have seminars going on we do we have two in-person seminars this weekend one in bernie and one in waco um, so head on out to those and you get to sit with other people who are the same same part of the process and kind of ask your questions, hear their questions, uh, learn more about them. And then we also on April 20th are going to have our Behind the Sheet Rock event in Angleton. Ayo. So we have two models under construction there. And this is your chance to come and see everything that's happening before we put up the sheet rock. So you can actually see all of this framing and those mechanicals that uh, Justin alluded to. Um, in person and see exactly what it looks like before we put the pretty stuff up because the quality is really behind that sheetrock guys and that's what you want to be looking at um, you know when you are evaluating and I think if if I understood Richard correctly he's going to have one model that is spray foamed so you you'll see what it looks like after it's been spray foam and one of them that the mechanicals and the studs and everything are still fully exposed so that you can mm -hmm. kind of see before and after justin's smiling about that. that's a smirk on the face got well i just know richard he uh he was probably told hey get one at spray foam and then hold the other one richard's not one to sit still so uh I, no, I, actually I richard brought that to me he said hey don do you think they want to see they want to see both phases talk about growth he's generally all gas and get it done so <laughs> he on can, to the next thing he can smash the gas when when summoned upon to do when so when needed when needed yeah, yeah. but uh truly good all the stuff we talked about the wind speed rating you'll see some things behind the sheetrock here and, and richard and others mm -hmm. will explain that of how it looks a little different here than it might in you know say lufkin or angelina county or someplace uh but still worth the trip and a lot to see a lot of interesting stuff um yeah. So, oh, we got Jason. Jason has a. I know. Jason's trying to pick a fight with you, and it was your birthday, no, so I wasn't going to show what it. But he what he's doing. Okay. He says, Happy birthday, Eric. Go celebrate at Whataburger. <laughs> <sighs> oh, why would we eat a, such a such a substandard meal when I could go to the sandbox in Okinawa and chow down yes. on be there, yeah, be there this I, time tomorrow? That'd be a much better birthday. That'd be a much better birthday. <laughs> would be kind of cool. All right. So, folks, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you at one of our events, of course. Hope to see you at the design centers. Um, we hope to see you next week or so as we're doing these things. Justin, we will, we will have him back to carry on mm -hmm. once we get inside this thing, when we start doing there. But between now and then, we, we hope to see you guys soon, and we generally soon hope to make you part of the Tilson family. We'll see you all later. Bye, everybody. Bye.